But my favorite thing is going to be Redotrutide, right? So Redotrutide is a GLP-1 agonist that's a little bit different than Ozempic and Manjaro. Targets the fat cells and breaks them down. Correct, okay. yes. Hey everybody, it's interesting how public perception of peptides changes based on who's talking about them. I'm sure many of you have heard about a Twitch streamer and influencer who's gone viral recently, a guy named King Clavicular. Everybody and their mother has made a video about him, so I figured, heck, I would too. And I know some of my subscribers generally don't like when I call people out, though others do enjoy social commentary, so I'll leave the ethical concerns of his actions to the rest of the internet. Instead, the focus of this video will be on his peptide stack claims rather than his character. For those of you who have a life outside of YouTube, this is a 19-year-old whose content centers around both soft looks maxing and hard looks maxing, which is more invasive, terms which until recently I had no idea existed. He claims to have been on steroids since early adolescence, thinks everybody should be on testosterone, claims to use crystal to improve his focus, promises a variety of cosmetic surgeries to his audience, and entangled with all that, he endorses the use of peptides, which is obviously more my bread and butter. So here's a chance to capitalize on a viral trend while hopefully doing some actual peptide education. According to a bastion of knowledge, Wikipedia, looks maxing refers to maximizing one's physical attractiveness, which gives us a useful lens through which to analyze peptide use. The term itself is controversial in that although it arguably falls under the umbrella of self-improvement, it can also impose a restrictive, hegemonic masculine gaze on male bodies that precipitates harmful behavior and chronic dissatisfaction. So let it be known that while I fully support men and women caring for themselves through optimizing sleep, exercise, social connection, the idea of hard maxing isn't one I personally get behind. Regardless, Clavicular has been talking a lot about peptides recently, which is normally a good thing when it encourages people to evaluate claims more critically. What I've noticed, though, is that reasonable people tend to maintain balanced takes, and it's important to clarify the line between proposed efficacy and outright misinformation so people don't lean fully into self-experiment. Regardless, we've all heard of Redotrutide by now, which is often framed as the next leap beyond current GLP-1 medications. Although, at this point, that narrative is yet to be confirmed, we have Phase 2 data and Redotrutide is now being being taken into phase 3 trials, but it remains fully experimental and is not FDA approved. I've covered the mechanism many times on this channel, so I'll keep this brief. Semaglutide is a selective GLP-1 receptor agonist that increases glucose-dependent insulin secretion while suppressing glucagon. Terzepatide adds a second axis of action by also activating the GIP receptor, and that dual agonism is supported by clinical data showing greater weight loss and glycemic control compared to semaglutide alone. Redotrutide goes one step further as a triple agonist, targeting GLP-1, GIP, and the glucagon receptor. Its glucagon activity appears to increase energy expenditure in addition to suppressing appetite, likely through effects on hepatic substrate utilization and fat oxidation. Phase 2 data are quite striking, but claims that it will overtake the market remain premature until Phase 3 outcomes and long-term safety are established, of course. Now, I'm happy to discuss Clavicular's entire path peptide stack if you're interested. He mentions Reta, BPC-157, MT2, and Cerebrolysin, among likely others. But the focus here will be on Redotrutide. And honestly, once you try to comprehensively analyze anecdote, existing data, and the reality that users are sourcing this entirely from gray market research supply chain, it becomes difficult. Combine that with the fact that its use is fully experimental at this stage, and it's a shaky foundation for interpretation. But let's see what Clavicular has to say. Anyway, back to the video about Redotrutide, aka the ultimate good. So what exactly is a GLP-1 agonist? Well, the agonism of the GLP-1 receptor is going to help us decrease the calories in portion of the equation by increasing hunger control and appetite suppression. It's also going to have its effect on gastric emptying, which means you're going to stay full for a little bit longer. So having a lesser meal frequency is much more favorable for people trying to lean max. Slower gastric emptying will also reduce post-meal glucose spikes and decrease demand on insulin secretion. So obviously, if you're able to eat less to satiate yourself, you're going to be having a much easier time staying in a calorie deficit 
and maintaining that calories in, calories out equation that we're talking about. So this is generally accurate. GLP-1 receptor agonists are thought to exert their effects through three primary mechanisms, delayed gastric emptying, increased insulin secretion, and suppression of glucagon release. Together, these effects reduce appetite and improve insulin sensitivity in ways that are metabolically favorable for people with obesity or diabetes. The literature clearly supports their ability to reduce caloric intake, thereby driving weight loss. There's also central nervous system signaling at play that blunts hunger and reward-driven eating behavior, which is now considered the dominant driver of weight loss. And this is why these drugs are being investigated in the world of diseases of addiction, among other concerns. Let's talk about the glucagon agonism. So this is where RETA really stands out from the dual and single and cretins. So glucagon is going to increase your heart rate and cardiac output. So what does that mean? more calories out. This also has an effect on your satiation and has another mechanism of slowing your gastric emptying. So this is really, really like putting all the puzzle pieces together. Glucagon has a multitude of effects on the liver and adipose tissue. In the liver, it increases liver cell survival and increases liposis, which creates free fatty acids. It also increases thermogenesis and liposis, which further drives the free fatty acids to convert into ketones. So this is literally forcing your body to burn excess fat. Most studies will indicate this is probably going to increase increase your caloric expenditure by about 150 to 200 calories. This clip is a bit more iffy. I'm not one to attack pronunciation, I mispronounce things myself, but in this case it matters. Remember, I initially pronounced retitrutide, retatrutide incorrectly until people corrected me. But glucagon and lipolysis are basic metabolic terms, and lipolysis quite literally describes what it means, lipo meaning fat and lysis meaning to break. Consistent mispronunciation suggests a lack of intrinsic understanding, speaking to speak, or even in part something to do with effort. As we mentioned earlier, GLP-1 receptor agonists suppress endogenous glucagon secretion, reducing both fasting and postprandial glucagon levels, so after eating. This lowers hepatic glucose production and prevents inappropriate post-meal glucagon spikes that would otherwise worsen hyperglycemia or these high blood sugar levels. That glucagon lowering effect is glucose dependent and preserved in patients with type 2 diabetes. Clavicular claims that glucagon increases heart rate and cardiac cardiac output in a way that explains retitrutide's metabolic effects. He is partially right in that glucagon can raise heart rate and cardiac output, but attributing that to the therapeutic efficacy of GLP-1 drugs is incorrect. GLP-1 agonists reduce endogenous glucagon secretion, which directly contradicts that framing. GLP-1 agonists are seen to increase heart rate, but they do so through direct stimulation of GLP-1 receptors in cardiac pacemaker cells altering electrical activity and calcium signaling with additional autonomic contribution, not through glucagon and not as a driver of weight loss. Redditrutide adds an important layer of nuance. It paradoxically suppresses endogenous glucagon secretion via its GLP-1 component while simultaneously activating glucagon receptors through its glucagon agonist arm. The metabolic benefits of glucagon agonism arise from direct hepatic effects increased fat oxidation, higher energy expenditure, and improved metabolic flexibility, not from heart rate elevation. Both GLP-1 and glucagon agonism can raise pulse modestly, but these are cardiovascular side effects to monitor, not mechanisms of therapeutic efficacy. About clavicular's last point, evidence does support that retitrutide enhances fatty acid oxidation and reduces hepatic lipogenesis, which may contribute to greater weight loss than GLP-1. P1 agonism alone, but the idea that it is thermogenic in the same way as compounds like DNP or BAM15 increasing metabolic output through mitochondrial heat production is false. So let's talk about the muscle retention on retitrutide versus the other GLP1s. Obviously all the GLP1 agonists are going to lead to fat loss, but we don't want to just lose weight, we want to lose adipose tissue and retain as much lean muscle mass as we can. Ozempic has a horrible amount of muscle loss, with an average of 23-30% to 30 of the weight loss being from muscle itself. Perzipatide is slightly better, but it's still in the neighborhood of 15-30%. to 30%. But retitrutide is only at 8-12% to 12 of the weight loss coming from muscle mass. This is mostly due to the glucagon and GIP anabolic signaling. So obviously retitrutide is going to be the most conducive to bodybuilding, looks maxing, whatever you want to call it, because you're going to retain the most lean muscle. 
What clavicular is suggesting next is that retitrutide results in the lowest proportion of muscle loss relative to fat loss. This isn't necessarily false, but it's premature. A month or two ago, I reviewed the data on muscle-specific loss with retitrutide, and it appears roughly comparable to other GLP-1 agents based on current national recommendations. A year from now, we'll have better clarity, but comparing phase 2 retitrutide data to phase 3 semaglutide and terzepatide trials is inherently indirect, with different sample sizes, follow-up durations, and measurement techniques for lean mass. I'm also not sure where clavicular's numerical claims originate such as 23-30% to 30 muscle loss with semaglutide versus 8-12% to 12 with retitrutide. These values aren't consistently supported by literature. In fact, available retitrutide body comp data shows that lean mass can still account for roughly one-third of total weight loss, similar to other obesity treatments. While glucagon agonism is theoretically favorable for adipose-targeted metabolism, chronic glucagon receptor activation is also known to increase amino acid acid oxidation and could promote muscle wasting or muscle catabolism, which would be the opposite intended effect. Overall, while retitrutide appears to produce greater absolute weight loss, current evidence suggests its lean mass effects are likely similar to competing GLP-1 agents. Muscle loss remains an active research focus across the entire drug class, and we discussed practical recommendations centering on resistance training and adequate protein intake in a recent video as well. So the studies show it has a lot of benefits on your liver with a 40 40 to 60% reduction in liver fat due to the enhanced fatty acid oxidation. This basically means the liver burns fat for energy instead of storing it. Finally, regarding clavicular's liver fat claims, data do support significant reductions in hepatic fat driven by increased fatty acid oxidation, but these benefits were observed primarily in individuals with obesity and metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease, not in metabolically healthy individuals. That distinction matters. While while reductions in liver fat are clinically meaningful in people with metabolic dysfunction, they are less relevant for the general population. I'd frame this similarly to other cardiometabolic improvements that accompany major weight loss, blood pressure reduction, improved sleep apnea, enhancements in insulin sensitivity, and lipid parameters. Overall, I enjoyed tracking retitrutide's development, and I hope this helped clarify some misinformation while outlining what we actually know at this stage. Retitrutide may eventually become a powerful metabolic tool like its predecessors, but significant gaps in long-term safety and phase 3 efficacy remain before it transitions from strictly experimental to FDA approved. If you want to see more content like this, let me know in the description below. Additionally, if you want me to cover more of clavicular's peptide stack, which is quite extensive, I'm happy to take a look too. If you're looking for an additional way to support the channel, there is a Patreon available, but I encourage you, if you haven't already, a like and subscribe goes a long way, and it's the best way to help a small peptide YouTuber out. Most importantly, thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.